Are we going? Yes. Okay, we are recording. Good afternoon, councillors. No mem members of the press. Good afternoon, Roger and George. You're the first two starting off on this council funded agency afternoon. Um, you've got half an hour. You guys want to speak to the report you've got there for a start, and then we go to questions, or what is the easiest way for you, Roger? Basically, I think I'll just go through um, the report and then I'll hand over to George to go through the financials. That's um, so the financials at the moment are just a, is just a draft report. Um, far away at the auditors at the moment. Um, January to June 21 saw a period of normality return to the venue with both entertainment and corporate events bouncing back to near pre-COVID levels. It was notable during the period of level restrictions in February, this bounce back was led mainly by the community events, which remained strong and provided a period of certainty during the February-March restrictions. That's one thing that we've noticed, or I've noticed quite a bit, some of the venues around the country um, they are probably not quite as tolerable of community events as what we are, um, and they've particularly found it hard during the lockdown now that, you know, without the touring events, especially international acts, um, that's finding it difficult to remain open, basically. Um, Isaac Theatre Royal would be the case in point. Um, we're actually getting quite a few events coming out of Christchurch down to Ashburton now because Isaac isn't really interested in having them. Um, there was one just the other day, the um, Canterbury Ballet, um, which is quite a big company. Uh, they're now wanting to come down to Ashburton to perform simply because we... We've had them before and supported them very well, and so they've looked, uh, book, made a booking to come back again. So that sort of thing is quite, um, you know, good for us as far as having that reassurance that you know there is the smaller community events that we can continue to do and provide that small amount of income during these periods. <coughs> um, while many national and international promoters are remaining positive and continue to make advanced bookings. It is under the proviso that level restrictions are viable for their event. This usually means at level one, with no additional restrictions attached. Where restrictions are put in place, they are postponing to later dates, which results in additional work for the admin staff, dealing with ticket refunds and the rescheduling of marketing and venue bookings. The most recent lockdown has resulted in the cancellation of four events and numerous bookings being shifted to later dates. Some of these are for the third and fourth time. And until the government can come up with some firmer timelines uh, for restriction levels, I fear this will continue. It has become evident patrons are now holding off purchasing tickets until close to uh, event dates, where more certainty for the event happening can be had. This, of course, adds to the promoter's stress by not knowing how many are likely to attend a performance and uncertainty when putting staff rosters together. <coughs> While the industry generally understands the necessity of having restrictions on gathering numbers, it flies directly in the face of what our industry is all about, bringing people together to enjoy each other's company in a social environment. The industry also understands it must now learn to adapt to the new norm and look for ways to improve the health and safety of our clients and employees when they attend events in our venue. A number of initiatives are up for discussion at the moment, including the use of vaccine passports for entry. The focus of these initiatives must be to reassure the public that they are coming into a safe environment where their primary concern is that of having an enjoyable night out without the constant reminder of level restrictions. Uh, the fallout from the collapse of Ticket Rocket is thankfully coming to an end, with just one affected event outstanding. While there have been some costs to ATEC associated with assisting promoters and audience members who were left out of pocket when Ticket Rocket collapsed, working closely with both parties has avoided that has, has avoided what could have been a very expensive period and maintained a very good working relationship uh, with our promoters and um, audience. Uh, the proposed technical upgrade for ATEC has again been affected. As part of our fundraising for the project, we were to have staged Jesus Christ Superstar uh, from the 30th of September to the 5th of October, and that was in conjunction with Variety Theatre Ashburton. 
Unfortunately, this was postponed two weeks before opening night due to liberal restrictions. <clears throat> we are currently in the process of rescheduling the production to March 2022 and uh, waiting on permission from the licence holders to shift those dates. With a casting crew of over 100 and almost 7,000 hours invested in the production, the cast is very keen to see it through to fruition and there appears to be a great deal of community support for the show to go ahead. With this in mind, we have added an additional performance date to try and re recoup some of the costs associated, associated with remounting the show. Two other fundraising performances were su su successfully held in 2020 and 21. Uh, Rock and Pop and Anzac Stories and Songs from the Frontline were both successful in raising funds for the upgrade. Uh, special thanks goes to Jenny Beach and Sally Farr for writing and directing the Anzac performance, and again the many cast and crew involved in both of these productions. Almost 30000 has been raised uh, from these productions uh, towards the upgrade. At a time where it is tough for charitable organisations, is it well, at a time where it is as tough for charitable organisations as it is for the funders, we acknowledge the organisations who have supported us in the, over the last 12 months. Uh, the Lion Foundation, Creative Communities, our business partners Hartland Bank, EA Network and Gary McCormick Transport, uh, the Ashburton District Council and the Trust Mid uh, Community Trust of Mid-South Canterbury. Their funding assures that the venue can remain viable and up-to-date as far as the uh, ability is going to serve the community. Uh, I think you must also go to our incredible team of volunteers who turn up week after week to assist with the running of events. And again, I include the many cast members and crew who so willingly step forward to, uh, to take part in our fundraising performances, because without them, those shows just wouldn't exist. Also to my staff for their continued support while working reduced hours where necessary during the uh, past and current periods of restriction. We are currently working rostered four day weeks in an effort to cut expenses. In summary, th these are very challenging times for not just us but the industry as a whole. The artists, venues, support staff and production businesses are all it, uh, and will continue to suffer while alert levels remain above level one. It is my hope that a level of certainty can be given by the government that allows the events industry to begin planning for future events with some certainty. We need sufficient lead in times that allow for successful planning and the implementation of recommended safety measures and clear logical guidelines that will allow our staff and audience to feel safe in the company of mass gatherings. <coughs> It seems crazy that a shopping mall with thousands of people having close passing contact with numerous other people and is able to operate when a venue with a capacity of 500, a guaranteed track and trace ability through ticket sales, and where patrons are seated and can be ushered in in an orderly fashion uh, that, that can reduce contact with others, has a limit of 100. Recent announcements around vaccine passports give some hope that the industry is being listened to and that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. In EVN's webinar meeting on Monday with other venue managers, managers and legal representatives from Tompkins Wake, we'll look at the implications of vaccine passports and answering questions uh, like, can you require the staff to be vaccinated? And can you make it a condition of entry that visitors approve their vaccination status? Does ticket identity at point of sale suffice for track and trace? Again, looking for some clear answers as to how the new norm for our industry will look. So that's us in a nutshell. In what has been a very trying 18 months, really. Thank you, Roger. Uh, you want to go to George first, or are there questions for Roger up to this point? I think if George just wants to go through the financials and... Yeah. There's no quest questions for you, so if, if you want to swap play... Oh, you've got, you've got a mic there. Yeah, George. Uh, I'll, I'll talk to the uh, KPMG end of year report, maybe first, uh, and I'll refer you 
So, sorry, Josh, can you just put your mic up properly because I can't really hear. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll refer to the report. Yeah, you, you, have to, you have to put your mark, mask on. On. Yeah, 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 no, no, over the face. Hey. Okay. You have to have it over the face. Sorry, oh, sorry. We, can't, we can't do that. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Thank you. I know it's a pain in the neck, not pain in the face, to be honest. But um, the I'd refer you first of all to page six, uh, probably page of, seven of your report of, of KPMG. Yeah. Page seven. So this year we had eight hundred and thirty-nine thousand of income compared to six eighty nine four eight. Um, and you might say, well, that's a pretty good year. There were a number of things in there that assisted us. One was the COVID wage subsidy, and we also received some other grants, one to help uh, for the training of the apprentice we have in the... So we did receive quite a few government grants, and we also received a Lion Foundation grant as well as the council. However, the trading, what we did have was pretty good, and pretty profitable, and there were two or three local shows, and the conference for Dairy and Z wasn't there. Mm. So they were pretty significant events, have quite a lot of cost associated with them, but they were significant income events. As far as our costs were concerned, we did, six, 12 months ago now, I suppose, significantly reduce the costs. And, uh, but you can see even their wages are still showing slightly up on last year. And what a lot of people don't get with the, with the wage subsidy is we're still accruing holidays and everything during, even though we're getting paid the COVID wage subsidy, we still are incurring liabilities and this is all included in these figures. So even though you get, get a wage subsidy, it does cost you quite a lot of money to keep the staff on, which we did during that period. So the end of the year result was a loss of 96000 but that's after depreciation. So the result ended up um, OK as far as we were concerned at that point in the year. If you turn over to the next page, there's a few items in there you might one to look pretty high. We've got bank accounts and cash at the end of the year 128,326. I'd refer you to note three because I'll explain what that is because people will say, oh, you've got an awful lot of cash. But during the year we, we uh, changed the ticketing system and we now have the trust account that we control. So in that bank accounts and cash, there is $60,000 worth of money in Westpac Trust account that is offset by money uh, and we've got a liability in, in the liabilities account uh, for the same amount under other current liabilities. So if you're looking at the true position of the trust, you've got to take the 60000 out on both sides because that is a trust account. And we... We do balance it. It's been a hell of a mission to keep this thing in, in trim, but it is, it is balanced, so any time anybody pays for a ticket, if the show's cancelled, they can apply for a refund, um, which is working OK, although probably has created us quite a lot of administration time to do it. Um, the rest of that is probably fairly self-explanatory. Um, the... The, the, the creditors at the end of the year were up, but that was because of the big events we held close to the end of the year, the college ball and the, and the uh, big catering job, and we had to pay for the bills in July, so it's, it probably works out OK. The cash flow um, is showing there, and um, again, the cash flow includes references to that ticketing account. The rest of the stuff is reasonably self-explanatory. I'd go over to page 12, which does detail some of that expenditure in more detail. In revenue, you can see we got grants of 28000 towards operating costs. That was from Lion and a couple of government ones. Naming rights of $5,000 from the Ashburton Trust. 
Um, and then in the other revenue, the COVID wage subsidy of 43,000, the apprenticeship boost of 9,700, that amounts, I think, Roger, correct me if I'm right, about $1,000 a month for one year, is it? For That's on a sliding scale, so that it re reduces in the following 12-month period. So we're paying the wages, but we do get this grant through the government for the training program. Under expenses, there haven't been any major worries on expenses. Um, the one that probably is likely to cause us most concern at the moment is power. Uh, we, unfortunately, our contract fell due uh, earlier this year, and we've been trying to renegotiate that without a lot of success at the highest point of the power price index. So we're at the moment just sitting waiting and hoping that something might happen, but it is quite a difficult one. At one stage we were talking a 50% increase, I think, weren't we, in the, in the power charge. Quite a complicated building, and we've got a computer program that smooths out power spit, spikes, but we still seem to have a difficulty keeping that power down. Uh, insurance, we've recently reviewed and had the everything revalued as part of our insurance program, and that's uh, with the help of the, the council insurance brokers. And um, I think it's sufficient to say we're relatively comfortable, we're fully insured, and the, the premium hasn't gone up dramatically in that area. Um, maybe I can just take questions, there's nothing else too much to report. We have done some small amounts of capital expenditure, and but we had planned to upgrade <coughs> certainly some of the lighting, which has been held up because they can't get the, some of the... It's fitting. actually been completed now, so... So it's been done now, so we did have some of that that we had underway, which was converting some of the stuff to LED. Uh, all in all, been a pretty difficult year, but we were very fortunate that we had the couple of big uh, events that the theatre organised that did help us. The Rock and Pop and the Anzac concert contributed significantly to these results, as well as the other big events which happened sort of early June, weren't they? Mm. Thank you, George. Um, I've got a couple of questions if I can start. You mentioned before the events you've got, the cost is quite a bit, a bit higher. Is that correct? Is it just because you've got spaces in between? or I think, uh, George, you mentioned it. You said some of the costs are higher than yes. what they normally are. Is that due to the COVID or is it just a an, an thing that's going C to happen? Certainly a result of anything we're doing in the uh, sound and electrical is higher because of COVID. But the costs that I was mainly referring to is when you run a conference like the Dairy NZ conference, <laughs> We have a high, very high cost of supplying food, and we do get paid for it with a margin on it. But you can see on the one side our expenses look high, but our income is also okay. covered. Generally, we haven't been... None of our costs have been materially altered with COVID, no. I don't think. Oh, OK. Yeah. Like going forward, um, I've had the price for the upgrade uh, re-evaluated and that's increased by roughly 5% um, over what it was 2019 hmm. um, but yeah it's generally electricity is probably the biggest one that's moved as far as costs go I've got some questions here Stuart you're the first one thanks Lane morning afternoon you two George when the were the naming rights renewed or just carried over? I mean, was there an opportunity to go out to the market again to see if you could perhaps get a um, higher figure or anything? They were certainly renewed, and we did talk about this last year. And because of we we get a lot of we didn't go out to the market at that point, and it was renewed for another five years, I think. Uh, it's ten years. Ten years. Yeah, ten years at five thousand. That was that wasn't this year. It was. Yeah, it's it's under this. I think we're under the third year of the contract. 
What has happened though, the trust have now changed their trust name and there is to be a proposed name change overall and they're going to pay for all of that because they're changing the name of the Ashburton <coughs> Trust to the Braided Rivers Trust. Thanks, George. Neil? Uh, good afternoon, Roger and George, and congratulations on the, the year been. It's been difficult, I know. We're all experiencing it, and you're no different. But just um, thinking about the electricity, when it was previously done, is it on the council's electricity scheme? Or no, not? we had to move off that. So we're, now, we're, still, we're still with Trust Power, um, but we weren't able to come under the umbrella of the council any longer. Do you know why you couldn't do that? Uh, they just told us we weren't allowed. Who's they? Uh, the trust. The, um, trust pair. Trust pair, sorry, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Seems odd. Yeah, but perhaps a question for whoever looks after it as to why they would, because you're an agency of council that's been there before, and um, why it's not there now? Oh, we're no longer with trust pair as a council. Oh, you're not? No, oh, so it could have been part of that change. <laughs> um, Might be. No, so, we know the reason. So supplementary then? Yep. Whoever you're with, could the um, event centre be under that umbrella with the new provider? We'll make a note of that request and see whether that's possible, okay. and if there would be advantage. Mm. Yeah, we had quotes from Mercury, Meridian and Trust Power. Trust Power still came out on top. Okay. And we were using uh, EA Networks to assist mm. us in that regard, mm. but um, we... We haven't really, we haven't finalised what we're doing with that yet, really, have we? Until we, uh, no, sorry, we have. We, we, we've gone with um, trust power. Trust power, right? Yeah. John, John, thank you, Lane. Well, for a difficult year, you guys have turned in a bloody good financial result. I mean, you've gone from negative current assets, less current liabilities last year to a very positive one this year. So um, I think the management has been excellent. No question all about that. The question I have is that we've now been at lockdown for about the same period that we were back in March, April 2020. Um, therefore, so we've had a full 12 months without really uh, COVID effect. If COVID, if we were to come out of lockdown tomorrow, would the result for 2022 be similar to the 2020 result, or could it be worse? My gut feeling at the moment is it will be worse. I think, you know, coming out of the first lockdown, there was a lot of promoters around that were just itching to get back on board and make things happen. Um, this time round, I don't get that same feeling. I think that they're a lot more gun shy. Um, they are definitely waiting to hear what's happening from the government you know, as to what restrictions venues are going to have. Um, and I, the same for the venues. You know, they're, they're hamstrung at the moment until the government comes up with some clear policy around how we operate. Um, because for us, anything above level one. It's just not viable for them, especially in a 500 seat venue. You know, some of the bigger ones, 1800 seat venues, if you cut that down to half by half, you can possibly make it work. But for a smaller venue, it's just not viable for the, the bigger touring events. So while I'd like to say that, yes, we'll be fine, I just have a, you know, a gut feeling at the moment that if this carries on through until the end of the year at level two, which I would just about guarantee it will. Um, I don't think we will be in that same position. Uh, John, you are right. We did, we did end up the year far better than we expected we would, um, and that was due to the fact that we really sat on costs, and we are doing a bit the same this year. But we were very fortunate that that period, what January to June, was extremely mm. buoyant for us, mm. and that was because we had the Dairy NZ conference and quite a few of those sort of things happen, which won't happen this year because it's only every now and again we get that one. And so I fear a lot of those events in that period have been carried over from the lockdown period. So, you know, a lot of them are postponing and just pushing everything forward. And 
So it, it was an incredibly busy period for that reason. One of the other slight difficulties you get into is that people get sick of going to the theatre every two or three weeks and we did have an awful lot of events at one stage and you're almost getting shows that you couldn't sell the tickets for because people would be probably sick of going out every mm. But we did have a few pretty good ones though, didn't we? Mm. And there is still some on the books that happen. Your ticket sales in general I don't see have altered a great deal. I think there's still, you know, this perception out there maybe that you know nobody wants to get into a crowd at the moment. Um, I didn't sort of see any downturn in ticket sales, you know, for the events that we had. Um, they were very good events, and you know should have been popular. Uh, so I don't, I don't think people are as gun shy as what we think they might be, you know, about getting out and about again. I still think there is a willingness for people to to go to events. But also a question, the tickets you've got in control yourself nowadays, isn't it? Yep. So you've got about $60,000 sitting there of people just left in the trust fund, fund to be used for the next show or like a show which you had to cancel? Yeah. Superstar, most of them are choosing to leave the money sitting there in the trust, hold the ticket and then they'll just re we'll re reallocate it yep. once dates are finalised. There has been a few asked for refunds, but not huge. Okay, so it works quite well for that. There and was a bit of a hangover with some of the shows that were coming and going, but to be fair, I think most of those we've either refunded or they've transferred the money to another show, haven't yeah. they? That's what yeah. they tended to do. Yeah, but each month we do have a reconciliation of what the money's, what money's yeah. in the trust yeah. and what it's held for, what shows it is. Yeah, no, great. No more questions, as I can see here. No more comments to be made. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you well much. done for this awful year. You came through it quite well. The next one on the list, we've got Safer Mid Canterbury at 2 o'clock. No, I didn't touch it. But I didn't. You can accept. I didn't touch it. Very well done. I knew it was yours, so I've been touched. <coughs> yes, yeah, next one is Safer Mid Canterbury. Good afternoon. We've got Kevin, Don and Leslie here. Welcome. Um, the floor is yours. Where do you want to start? Right. Thank you. I'll just open all my stuff. <laughs> I normally would have been in the back getting it ready, but... <laughs> the, pu the push in the front this time. <laughs> Whenever you're ready. Yeah, thank you. I don't know, but um, I've just been told, do you know, you guys know that it's live streaming? Sorry? It, is, it is live streaming what we're doing at the moment. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. So if you want to say hello to mum, just the camera. <laughs> I'll, I'll try not to do anything too silly if I'm on TV. <laughs> um, well, thank you for the opportunity to uh, come along today. And I'd like to, to the, the mayor and the chair and the councillors and think a staff member, a couple of staff members, oh, there's another one. <laughs> um, so thanks for the opportunity to come along today and present our six-month report. Um, I'll just start by going through some of the, the key points of uh, our report and then highlight some of the main pieces of work that we've had over the course of the last six months. And then, of course, um, it's not possible for me to talk about every aspect of the organisation, but people might have questions about various things I haven't covered that are in our report. Um, firstly, just to talk about uh, the first part of our 
report in Appendix B that part of our contract. Our requirement to secure a sound return on investment through leveraging council funding has not only again been met, but has been increased. And, excuse me, I just remember I've got glasses now. There you go. Oh, oh dear. Oh, well. I was wondering why I couldn't see my notes. And they are fogging up. Um, so just talking about uh, leveraging council funding has not only been again been met, but has been increased. Council's contribution for the last 12 month pre urge has remained the same over the previous two years, 211,806. Well, that's not going to work. However, we have been uh, seen income go from uh, 1,406,000 in the 2019-20 year to 1,836,000 in the 2021 year, an increase of 430,000 in income. This in increase in income is due to accessing increased funding and thus increasing the provision of services locally through additional central government funding. It's also worth noting here that as the final six month period came to a close, we were entering into um, contract negotiations that would see our income increase substantially again for the coming year, which will again see an increase on return on investment for Council. Our current budget for the 21-22 year is for a projected income of 2.5 million, uh, a further increase of around 660,000 on the current year we're reporting on. There are three main areas of funding that are contributing to the increase in our funding. Firstly, moving to full staffing of the Refugee Resettlement Service. Secondly, a new contract to provide cultural navigation for a new refugee health service. And thirdly, an increase in our court restorative justice services. As an organisation, we've provided restorative justice services to the Ashburton District Court for the last 22 years. In the last year, we were approached by the Ministry of Justice to take over provision of the service in the Timaru District Court as the provider there pulled out. And subsequently to this, um, at the start of 2021, the Omaru provider also pulled out of their contract and again the Ministry of Justice approached us to take over provision of the Omaru District Court. It's difficult for a provider to generate enough income when covering one small rural court. And this is why the providers did not continue in those areas. However, the scale of covering three courts again makes the contract viable financially. The advantage we gain from this work is that the ability to generate income that comes back into our district supporting and underpinning the local work we do with local people. Um, fiscally, over the last financial year, we've achieved a slightly better than break-even position, posting a profit of 2,600. So we've expended all but a very small amount of a year's income. We do have reserves currently and of funding in the area of around 300,000. However, given our projected budget of 2.5 million for the coming year, our board felt it was prudent not to expend this at this point of time, as it only represents around six weeks of cash flow and turnover. We're in a very uncertain times in regard to ensuring guaranteed income due to the risk associated with COVID and the possibility of competitive funding um, being lost. And so um, we're trying to be, the board is at a time where they're trying to be very prudent around that. Additionally, with the increase in service provision, we believe it likely we may need to add uh, new vehicles and also uh, replace um, our computer system, which is on the cards, but also looking at more space, which could increase our rental, or we may need to look at other ways to increase space. Of the 300,000 we currently hold in reserve, 77,000 sits in our depreciation account and is from depreciation over the last two years that we haven't spent. It is tagged for expenditure on replacement of vehicles in our ageing commuter system over the next three years. Uh, we haven't replaced any vehicles in the last two years, but we have bought additional vehicles, so we did not use depreciation funding for new purchases, just for replacement and sort of thing. Um, and also a further 22,000 of the funding we hold and reserve is from profit from the refugee service, which will be required to spend, be spent in the next coming year in the refugee service. In addition to that, we've also been supporting a small group in Methuen called Wellbeing Opoki, 
and being overseeing their uh, finances until they formed a trust. Of that money, 22,000 of that belongs to them as well, which we will return to them once they form their trust. Um, they were using us as an umbrella organisation to apply for funding. Um, we've remained very busy delivering services over the last six months, with highlighted need coming from within families and youth and also through migrants. Uh, whilst some of our figures have remained similar, we've actually found that families are more complex and are staying within our service area longer. We've also continued to, we've continued to see a drop in both youth and adult offending in our community, which is a great trend for our community. Many will remember only five years ago, public meetings being called to address youth offending. And uh, sort of, I suppose people might remember that we had very high youth offending about five years ago. And our organisation, among others, increased services to respond to that. Um, youth offending seems to be at its lowest point in many years, probably in the last decade. This isn't to say our youth just, justice services aren't busy, but what we're able to do is to be far more proactive working with people at an earlier stage to provide supports that have a greater chance of ensuring young people are making positive outcomes and not moving into offending in the first place. So that's a really positive place to be. The key areas of work for us over the last six months have been firstly in the refugee resettlement service. Families arriving in our district had been on hold for some time due to COVID, as people will be aware. However, in the previous six months, saw our first refugee family starting to arrive in the district and settle into their new homes. We had been sitting with just one staff member, Cathy Arrington Watt, in that service over the past year in a holding pattern. However, in February, the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment asked us to fill all positions in that service, and that uh, fully full staffing in that service is five staff. Um, so we worked to that. Obviously, um, things have been held up a little at the moment with COVID, but we have had families arriving and there are families sitting in Mungaree waiting to come when they can. As already mentioned, we've increased the size of our restorative justice service to cover three courts. This involved a substantial amount of work over the last uh, six months, increasing uh, or developing a service for those areas and the recruitment of four additional staff to cover those courts. We also launched a new project in February, February called the Community Connector, um, not to be mistaken with the Community Transport Project. It appears all the new funding like to use the word Community Connector, but it's quite separate to that. Uh, this is a service funded by the Ministry of Social Development that involved the employment of a new staff member to support individuals and families affected by COVID. So we take referrals for this from a large range of issues. However, it also does have a focus on people who have been affected around employment and income. And we can support those people to get the supports they need and move back into employment. Um, in the past six months, we've also been negotiating a contract to employ cultural navigators for a new refugee health service being established in Ashburton. Uh, the contract will see us employ two full-time staff in Ashburton. And we're just, um, the contract was put in place in the last six months, but the staffing uh, was still in the recruitment phase for that, which is closing shortly. Another significant project for us over the last six months was the internal restructuring of our organisation. Last time we reported to Council and, and spoke of the review that took place that was conducted by Sheffield Consultants, and they came back with a number of recommendations. One in particular was the realignment of responsibilities and opportunities for staff to take on more responsibilities in the organisation. This also ensured that total responsibility for every aspect of the organisation didn't sit with one person, the general manager, having all knowledge and oversight. Um, sitting with one person was highlighted as quite a risk for the organisation, which the board had also identified at an earlier stage. The review recommended the creation of teams within the organisation and the opportunity for current staff to take on the responsibilities of team leadership. As such, four new teams have been created within the organisation. These are the Child and Youth Services Team, Family and Community Services Team, Refugee and Migrant Services Team, and the Court Services Team. Each team has a team leader who has approximately seven direct reports, along with also carrying out their own service area that they work in. So they're not purely just team leaders. This process was uh, developed and put in place at the start of the year with the transfer of reporting lines officially starting on the 1st of April. It is now well embedded in the organisation and working well. 
with staff reporting feeling more supported and a wider number of people now with direct knowledge of the day-to-day -day running and management of the organisation. Other recommendations in the report are being worked on, with our trust deed being reviewed and rewritten over the past 12 months, and the board looking at recruitment, retention and membership of trustees. We've also put a new client management system in place. Um, this was highlighted in the report as not being fit for purpose. So that's taken a substantial amount of work over the past um, six months and um, with a lot of training and a learning for staff on an entirely new system that we are now utilising. Other recommendations are around the review and rewrite of policies and procedures to ensure they um, were fit for purpose and kept pace with the increasing breadth of the organisation. This work has started and will continue to occupy a large amount of my time over the next, next six months. Over the past year, in addition to Sheffield's review of our organisation, we also conducted a capability and capacity assessment through the Ministry of Social Development, which reinforced what Sheffield had found, but importantly allowed us to create an action plan to achieve the recommendations and seek funding from MSD to make all of this possible. And the fund, MSD provided with funding of 49000 to support the changes in our organisation. In addition to this, we are we were also audited uh, this year in March by the Ministry of Social Development Approvals team. There's quite a different team uh, from the uh, people that funded this. And uh, the audit is to gauge that we are continuing to meet the standards that we must meet to be a government contractor. And the audit also looks for evidence that we are delivering services and achieving outcomes on the services we're contracted to deliver and that we report on. Uh, they, they look for a lot of evidence and information to ensure that what we're reporting on is evidenced and what we're saying the outcomes are, are evidenced. Um, so it's been an incredibly busy six months with a lot of change and growth, new processes and systems, new reporting lines, new services, new staff, whilst continuing to deliver services in uncertain and unusual times. However, as an organisation, we've remained in a strong position, in fact, probably because of all our work, in a stronger position around our capability and capacity than we were at this time last year. Um, it would take some time for me to talk about every single service, probably a few hours, so uh, rather than go over that, I'll allow people might like to ask about any particular services we're delivering that I haven't talked about. But just prior to that, um, I'd just like to hand over to our... Trustee Chair Don McLeod, who would just like to say a couple of words. Thanks, Kevin, and thank you, uh, Mr Mayor and Councillors and staff, <coughs> for having us here. Uh, I won't take up too much of your time. Um, Kevin's comments about the finances are really good. My salary has doubled, so I'm very happy about that. <coughs> um, the, the summary on page 8 of our annual report uh, gives you a good picture of the overall structure of the organisation, and you'll see um, that it is uh, a pretty coherent whole. Um, and the only other thing I want to say at this stage is that um, part of our review was a review of Kevin's performance. While we've done that internally for some years, we've also done it in this case externally. Uh, and uh, I repeat the comments I made in the annual report, which is that we are very lucky to have him guiding our service. Uh, we're in good hands. You're Money and your trust is in good hands, uh, and I'm happy to uh, leave Kevin to answer all the tricky questions. Thank you, Don. Are there any questions, councillors? <coughs> Lynette, you're the first off. From, from year to year, the numbers of people in like the Cactus Programme and some of these other ones, are they sort of stabilised? Are they going up? You know, what are the trends? You know, because we only just sort of get one year's figures. We don't sort of see a bank of them. So most of our contracts will have a... For example, we have a youth support contract through Oranga Tamariki. They contract us to work with 34 young people a year. So each year we will work with 34 young people, and um, that's kind of our capacity. And so that most of our contracts will have similar figures each year unless we advocate for um, increased funding within that contract. But usually we don't get that. 
pretty much all of our growth is for new contracts that have a new figure attached to them, but those figures remain stagnant each year because the contracts, we'll get a four-year contract, it'll be 34 people a year or 15 families or sort of that sort of thing. So I suppose all I can say in a comment to that is around our youth support work, uh, it is busy and we do at times have uh, waiting lists, um, but we've always sort of had that, but we seem to be able to yeah, manage okay. Carolyn, Nick, you. I saw your line coming up before. Okay, John, you didn't. Oh, I saw your name coming up. Thank you, Lane. I note that the cash flow um, this year was back 100k on the previous year. Is this partly a result of the new services you're developing, and you're developing? You've got the costs of developing those new services prior to you actually getting the money coming in. Uh, well, just let me look at the cash flow. Yeah, I mean, I think in part we received a lot of cash in the previous financial year to deliver services that we didn't deliver because of COVID. And so we utilised that funding in the next financial year, but obviously the cash had already come in in the previous financial year. And so there was uh, quite a bit of money we had to carry forward that we couldn't spend. That's probably the main oh, sorry. Neil? reason for the difference. Neil, you've got a question? Thanks, yeah. um, Kevin and Don, for your reports. Um, well done. Been another successful year. COVID's gotten away, obviously, as with everyone else, but um, you've come through it not too bad. Speaking of COVID, speaking safer mid Canterbury, vaccinations. Any link with the organisation to get people vaccinated? Any synergies there? We, it's not something we've looked at or talked about or done anything about. Yeah, and not getting something the, anybody's approached us on. Okay. Yeah. We're getting to the pointy end of it now. We're up around 70% either engaged or vaccinated. 30% odd to go. It could be a bit higher than that now, but getting the last lot are going to be the hard bit. And I'm wondering whether it might be a long bow, but whether it fits in your something we all need to do is to get those who want to are eligible vaccinated vaccinated i think it's <clears throat> if i can just respond briefly neil i think it's fair to say we'd be happy to uh, be involved in any way that was appropriate i know the COVID, um the vaccination process and the tracing process and so on is extended to other organizations to administer vaccines and so on in the town so there's now a number of sources for that uh, we haven't had any direct involvement in that process, but if there was a way we could help, we'd be happy to look at it. No more questions. Oh, John. Sorry. Thank you. I note when I look at your depreciation schedule, you have spent $95,000 on extra vehicles, as you said. I just wonder, though, buying two brand new SUVs and a, a ute, what relevance do they have for the organisation when I thought you'd be wanting to have your uh, team running around in cars or vans type of thing rather than expensive utes and SUVs. Uh, so they are, we don't have a ute, they're all seven seaters, seven seater vehicles, uh, firstly. Secondly, um, we require larger vehicles to transport families. And so we do a huge amount of transporting of the refugee families and two of the vehicles were, as part of our tender, two seven-seat SUVs were part of the Mitsubishi Outlanders and they were part of our tender bid to, because we don't have public transport so we could cart families. Uh, we toyed with the idea of a van but we felt it was far better for the same money to buy two vehicles so two staff could use it to transport people. We also run a lot of children's programs where we have a six to one ratio of staff member to children. And so we use the seven seater vehicles quite a lot for camps and for transporting children a few times a weekend in the weekends. So um, that's the reason why we buy seven seaters. We've always had seven seaters. Um, the yeah. one you're probably referring to a ute is probably a, uh, it is a seven seater, but when Holden shut down, we managed to get some extremely cheap vehicles as well. So we took advantage of what was ever left and they were all seven seaters, so yeah. Just, just in addition, 
we do have some very small vehicles that run uh, at huge, um, hugely economical rates. And unless we are carting um, groups of people around, we uh, insist that our staff use the little cars. So it's uh, it's a balancing act. But but the um, we, we we think we handle that pretty well. We also have a better booking system, I suppose you'd say, for the vehicles now, which enables us to keep track of um, who's got which vehicle and what for. So we we do work pretty hard at that one. Thank you, Norm. Liz? Thank you, and I was probably just going to comment, you've also got an e-bike that um, staff can use to drive to sort of shorter, um, well, not drive, ride to shorter um, locations or, yeah. Um, but I'm the councillor rep on the Safe and McCannery board and, and uh, great report, thank you both, and it's just Really good to see where there's been a lot of um, changes in movement over the past year and I think um, organising um, the staff into the four teams and having team leaders has been something really positive. But um, So yeah, I think that's been really good and it's very clear in the, in the report that you've given us as well. One uh, question I was just going to, well, something I was going to mention is about um, our trust deed, which um, we worked away at. Um, but also um, the idea of having an AGM, and it was supposed to be tomorrow, but got um, canned with COVID. But do you just want to maybe explain how we've ended up with having an AGM where we haven't had one in the past? Sure. Well, um, obviously the organisation has been running for 25 years, but when it was first established, it was established as a safer community council, so it had a committee of... Um, I think it was 25 odd people and they were representatives of organisations and so instead of an AGM the board reported or the core group of trustees reported to that uh, community council I suppose every year and when Safe Communities was established the that larger uh, conglomeration of people became the Safe Communities Committee it was sort of morphed into that which reinvigorated it and um, took that away from oversight of this organisation and so um, we had a bit of a restructure and ended up with just our main trustees overseeing the organisation. It tidied up a lot because we've sort of, once upon a time we had 25 trustees and it was quite messy. Um, so now we have our, our five trustees and because we no longer report to that group, uh, it was decided we would start holding an AGM to report to the community because that group was, I suppose, our community. Um, and part of it also within the review, what came through in the review that was conducted was staff talking about wanting to have a stronger relationship with our board. And so one of the first mechanisms for that was to have staff and board members at the AGM as a, a starting point to come together and hear from each other. Um, and also our key stakeholders. So, yeah, so that's where the AGM came from. And... Uh, we've postponed it because one of our keys for our AGM wasn't just to hold a meeting, but was to bring people together so they could talk, meet each other, mingle, share ideas over a bit of food. And at the moment, that's not quite possible. So we've postponed it till the start of November in the hope that we'll be able to do that. Thank you for that. Just a question from me. You mentioned you're outgrowing the office you're in. How far away are you from that? Or can you still put some extra pe people in where you are. Uh, sorry, I didn't quite get all that. So you're oh, sorry. talking about where we're accommodated. You, you mentioned, mentioned the office you've got now, the office space, is getting too small. Mm -hmm. So you're looking for or an extension or going somewhere else. Is that correct? Uh, at this point in time, we have spoken to our uh, community house, who's obviously the building we're in, and talked about the need for additional space to be able to operate properly and see our clients. Uh, they have been very interested in us coming back to them with a proposal. So that's where we're sitting at the moment. We're not looking outside that space. Hmm. But that proposal would include asking them to create more space for us, which could involve them having to invest money, which will no doubt involve them wanting more money from us. Probably quite a bit if they're investing money. Hmm. And, and we're looking for a reasonable amount of space because things have grown quite quickly and we're kind of on top of each other at the moment. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you for that. There's no more questions. Gentlemen, thank you for the reports and all the good work you're doing every time again.
Mr. Chairman, can I just say thank you again for the opportunity to be here. Um, I've said in my comments in this report that this community is um, incredibly fortunate but also incredibly hardworking at looking after each other and um, the council has a significant part to play in the way we look after the community. Uh, so I just want to thank you again for your part in our funding which enables us to do the things we do. We are appreciative of the, the support we get from here. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. That's great. The next one, we've got 2.30, so we've got three minutes. We're doing well. And it is Leslie, Safe Communities. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Yes. I normally stay to sit because I have a bit to do with what's he does, so just to say um, there's some very good work going on there too, and thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. I'm oh, just going to sit stay, here yeah, in you case can stay. Leslie gets any tricky financial yep, questions. Yep, that's fine. That's the tricky seat over oh, there. Okay. Tricky you've questions in that direction, thank you, you. You've got the easy part in, Leslie. Um, oh, right, I'm going to fog up. I know I am, but I need to put my glasses on. We, we all do. Just get oh. to the moment. We just get to the next. Oh, I'm fogging up. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to come and talk about the Safe Communities Ashburton District Programme, which is only one program of many at Safer Mid Canterbury, so it's great to have the opportunity to hold the floor for half an hour about what just one program. Um, just to point out the material that you've got, um, you had the annual report in your documentation somewhere, which is for 20 to 21, and that represents year two of our five year strategic plan. Um, there's also a letter in your documentation from the Safe Communities Foundation of New Zealand and that was commenting on the annual report that they provided, we provided to them and that's, they've got some quite nice comments in it and some interesting things for us to follow up. And also the Safe Amid Canterbury lovely annual report that you've had a separate copy of. If you have a look at page 11, uh, Councillor McMillan, as the chair of that steering group's report, is in there. And then on page 12 to 13, there's another two pages on um, what's been achieved by this program over the 12 months. So we, we sit still at 27 agencies with membership of the group. And um, the group has actually grown in terms of attendance numbers. Um, the, the meeting that we had, not the last one, which was a Zoom, the one before that, we had more people come along than I think we've ever had before. Uh, we were quite surprised, but it's good to see that it's very much valued um, by the people that attend. I want to particularly thank uh, Liz McMillan. She doesn't just chair the um, committee, she even does things like offers to be a volunteer driver for the Mid Canterbury Connector Service. So she's in there, boots and all, which is great. Also, very much thanks to uh, Councillor Rawlinson, who comes along and supports the program. And looking back um, over this 12 months, uh, Ca Councillor Cameron, who had a major role in the development of the Citizens Advice Bureau, and her advice was, was great um, to have on board. So the program's based on, the mo on a model of collaboration, and the idea is that together we're going to achieve a lot more than on our own, being one little tiny agency um, that's saying we have an issue in our community. If a group of us to get together and can pull our ideas, we're going to have a lot more um, impact. So looking back over the last 12 months, and you probably know a lot of this, so I'll go through this pretty quickly. So we developed our community transport service, the Mid Canterbury Connector, we opened the Citizens Advice Bureau, and I won't talk any more about that because Sarah is coming after afternoon tea, and I then move into the tricky chair, apparently, um, to, to um, be there for her. Um, we've got a network of agencies looking at falls prevention in older people, um, and some, well, some really interesting facts and figures the other day at a meeting that there are 24 strength and balance classes for older people around the district. And there's something like 600 people doing those programs. It's been whacked by COVID, of course. Um, they're, they're having to practice social distancing. The class numbers have dropped. I think a lot of older people are a bit scared to come out. Um, but certainly when we get back to level one, we're going to be really promoting that good news story and that those classes are there for people um, to help them stay flexible and mobile as they get older. 
We did a lot of work over this 12 months with the Mid-Canterbury Suicide Prevention Group and the Charter and the Strategy. Um, and we took on coordinating the Caring for Communities Group. And that came out of the welfare response in the last lockdown in March last year and has tended to morph into a very large collection of agencies um, who have been quite focused on action and on tackling some of the big issues that are floating around in our community. And one of the big ones that keep, keeps coming up is the issue around social and emergency housing. So that group now has its own working group and has come up with some really good ideas around from tiny little ideas to great big huge ideas around how to um, tackle that issue for the community. Not everything went to plan. Safety Village at the AMP show was cancelled last year uh, with a month's notice and um, we're sitting at the moment wondering whether it's going to happen for us again this year. We had our free column in the Courier newspaper, so I don't know whether you've seen that. That comes out on the first Thursday of the month. The Courier have been great at providing that. Our agencies have all rushed on board to use it to promote various activities and events that they've got. Um, ACADS, for instance, used the December one last year and they promoted their drink driving campaign and used that free publicity. And it's interesting, working with a lot of those agencies, they have no budget for promotion. So they're highly um, grateful to have an opportunity to get that paragraph into the newspaper and be recognised for what they're doing. And the Courier have just offered us that for another year. Right, I'm on page two. Um, so we do very carefully research what we do. We, we try to base our work on data analysis, good consultation, write, re, reading strategies, etc. so that we are making sure that where we've got resources, we are ably pinning them towards something that is a real issue, that we can demonstrate as a real issue through data analysis. And... Um, we design them to be independently managed, long-lasting, what I refer to each year as a legacy project. So something that will be there way beyond me, way beyond this project that, that will be independently managed, such as the CAB, um, which at the moment is setting itself up as an incorporated society. And that project is, is now growing in leaps and bounds, and I have absolutely nothing to do with it. So I've done my bit, handed it over, legacy project going to be there forever, which is great. And that approach is good because it frees up the steering group and, and the coordinator to move on to other things because things keep coming up um, all the time because nothing, nothing's static in communities. There's always a different issue putting its head up. So I won't go through all of the um, data, but we know that we've got some above, it, above the norm data around things like falls in older people so older people being over 65 and particularly over 75, where people are ending up in hospital um, and some people are actually dying from, from a fall. Um, road crashes, which the Road, the road Safety Coordinating Committee, chaired by Councillor um, Lovett, looks after that. Um, and we go along and make those linkages to those groups. Theft and burglary is an interesting one, and I'll talk a little bit about that a bit more. Family harm and suicide. So we've got some things there that are issues um, for this community, they're issues for all communities and um, we're trying to work collaboratively to do something about those. Um, sorry, I'm fogging up, it's really hard to read my notes. <laughs> okay, um, so we talked enough about the old stuff. I thought I'd take the opportunity and I'm supposed to be reporting on what we did over that year, but just to give you a bit of an idea about some new things that are coming up. So one is a, a new collaboration with um, Senior Sergeant Lee Jenkins from the police and with our neighbourhood support person, Sue Abel. And that came out of um, discussion with Lee around the fact that he felt that people were not best aware in the district about how to prevent crime, like basic, basic stuff about how to keep your vehicle safe, um, how to keep your home safe, and one of the big issues for them is when they do recover tradie tools from a burglary, if they're not marked or engraved, they don't know who to return them to. So he asked us, Sue and I, to get our heads around a campaign that we could do that is around 
basic information. And so we've got three lovely flyers hot off the press, which I, um, if it's appropriate, I can hand them round for you to have a copy. So one's on hat homes, one's on tradies tools, and one's on vehicles. And they're the base of the campaign. Thanks, Steve. And what we're going to do with that is then um, have a, I think it's a six-week campaign in the Korean newspaper. We're going to provide speakers from the police and from the neighbourhood support person, Sue Abel, and they will be available to go and talk to community groups and, and we'll have a six-week campaign. And hopefully we might do that every year or every second year, and it's called the Let's Keep Safe campaign. And we've also um, been in talks with Men's Shed, hoping to get them on board to do the engraving of the tradie tools, because that apparently is quite a big issue here. We don't have the stats, but we hear anecdotally that tradie tool theft, particularly on site, off, off building sites, is actually quite a big issue. So that's one that we're doing. We're also looking at um, child safety child injury, and that came out of ACC providing our steering group with quite a lot of um, data about accidents for people, young people 0 to 14, and what the key um, causes of that were. So we're doing quite a bit of work around developing a, a child education program for parents around just things in the home like that, that could poison, poison your child or hurt your child. And we're also looking at a ski program because the number one sports injury for young people 5 to 14 in the district, obviously because we've got Mount Hutt, is skiing and snowboarding injuries. And that, that's ACC data, so we're going to, pres to um, develop a program. <coughs> okay, the other really exciting one you actually see in the paper next week in both The Guardian and The Courier is a new collaboration that we've done with the Council, with Martin Lowe from the um, Road Safety Coordinating Committee and ACC and, and us and it's Motorcycle Awareness Month. So next week for the next three weeks in both newspapers, there's a whole lot of information, um, really lovely, beautifully designed information going out about motorcycle safety, where you can create, where you can get a program from, um, etc. So that's going to be, I think, quite well received. And again, that's the start of a campaign that we could do every year. Normally, Motorcycle Awareness Month is September, but it's been pushed out to October. Um, and another one we're working on at the moment is a parent survey to find out what parents value in terms of um, programs in the district and where there could potentially be some gaps, like what's, where are things falling through the cracks for parents? What sort of help would do they need that's not available at the moment? So we're doing a big survey um, and there's a number of agencies working on that. Um, we are beginning, hopefully shortly, the feasibility study with Martin Lowe again um, and ACC looking at the off-road kids cycle safety and road rules track. Um, and we will be next week hearing the results of the follow-up research that the independent researcher Sarah Wiley has done for the Caring for Communities group, which is looking at a year down the track, that group, what, what has actually been achieved by that group. Um, what is a future role for that group, and particularly what are her recommendations around the social and emergency housing set of issues. And we will be starting to apply in the new um, business plan the results-based accountability evaluation stuff that we talked about, I think, last time I was here, which will help us to, to much more clearly define that what we're doing is actually making a difference. So instead of running a whole lot of sessions about something, it's actually going back and saying to parents, look, a month after that, what did you actually do in your home to make your home safer for the children that live in your home? Rather than, oh, we ran seven sessions and we had 10 people each and we had 70 people. <coughs> so, um, yeah, so that's, that's about it. So um, things are going well. You can see there's a range of new things coming up. Um, I think it will continue to evolve like that. There'll be a set of staples that we continue to, to do, and I think every year work, there will be new things that come up as issues for the community around community safety that, because we've got such a proactive group ready and able to get into it, they will, they will um, pick it up and have a look at it. Um, we really appreciate the support of the council, particularly um, including us in your 10-year long-term plan. That's given a lot of... Um, uh, 
sense of well wellness to to the committee around you know the fact that we can get on not thinking that you know we might not have the funding to do the stuff we want to do next year and we also of course have ACC funding so that money is um, three years so we've got two, three more years of that funding five years in total so I'll stop now because um, I'm fogging up again it's actually really hard to breathe inside one of these things <sighs> you tried to tell us <laughs> So uh, any comments or questions? And I mean, Kevin, I don't know if Kevin wants to say anything because he is in the tricky seat, so you should throw okay, something at okay, him. Okay, yeah, well, we, throw him something. we just keep him warm <laughs> on that side. Are there any questions for Leslie or any comments you want to make, Councillor? John, you're the first one. Thank you. Um, basically, you're obviously very busy and you're looking at lots of new projects. Obviously, I presume you're looking at what sort of projects are you looking at going forward over the next two or three years? Have you, does your planning go that far forward or not? It tends to go out through another year. So at the moment we have a very detailed business plan that goes through to July next year. And in November, December, we will start working on the next one. So we're always running about six months ahead in terms of planning stuff. And a lot of them are just running through. You know, they, they, they run through as the St. Falls and older people will, will always be there as something for us to focus on. But we want to allow room for other, other things to come to the fore as, as it comes up in the community as an issue, which is why it's so important to make those projects self-managing and hand them over so that my time and the committee's time isn't spent holding things and, and thinking, well, we're at capacity, we can't do anything else. Does that sort of answer your question? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Angus. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, Leslie, I'm going to ask a question about the Community Transport Service. And from your writings here that we received, um, the funding for the second six months of the operation, July to December 2021, was received from MSD. It's the next bit I'm interested in. From Environment Canterbury included in the long-term plan 2021 to 2031. The money you receive from Environment Canterbury, can, are you able to tell us where that originates from? Is it rates collected in the Ashburton district or is it government money? It's a rate imposed on ratepayers bar the boundaries of Ashburton Township because Ashburton Township has a commercial taxi service we do not compete with a with a commercial business so we took a the uh, ECAN took a rate across the rest of the district but did not include the boundary town boundaries of Ashburton so I think it was about two dollars a year per resident or something so the funding that we're going to get is uh, hasn't arrived yet but we will get ten thousand dollars from ECAN and so, that's now in their long-term plan. So is that per year for one for six months? Per year in their long-term plan. Each year. Thank you. Okay, we just got. Oh, oh, okay, Roger, you first. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, you've got a, a, a section here on suicide prevention, and we hear a lot about suicide today. Uh, the stress that people are under, particularly in the rural area, which has been tough and with floods and that. Uh, are we getting on top of it? or, or um, do, do we know if it's increasing or reducing? or Like it's something, unless you probe, you don't really know, do you? There's the tricky question. <laughs> yeah. um, that, well, it's actually a very tricky question to answer because when we look at statistics around suicide in a small community, we look at decades and trends over decades. Yes. Because a trend over a year or two is not a trend at all. And um, you can just look over the last few years at the wide range of things that have happened that we never anticipated that could affect people's well-being and mental health. Yes. Uh, you know, we've had flooding that we haven't had before. We've had bovis that we haven't had before. We've had drops in dairy prices, we've had earthquakes, we've had COVID, <laughs> all sorts of things. And so um, the question the answer to that is, is you really have to look over decades yeah. to see the long-term trends because you could have spikes each year that aren't necessarily a trend. But um, all we can say is more effort is going in to supporting people in our community and in particular in our rural community around wellness and well-being. 
um, and so we can we know that what we're doing is best practice, and but we, it's not really measurable in the short term. Okay, th thank you very much. I do note that um, you've got a list of all the mental health services now in the Ashburton district, which uh, which is a very good start. So thank you for that. Thank you, Dr. List. You've got some comments. Thank you. I was just going to make a comment on the um, the ECAN fund. So. The total funding is ten thousand dollars, and that's split um, five thousand from Environment Canterbury and five thousand from Waka Kotahi NZTA. So um, there was in the in Environment Canterbury's um, long-term plan submissions. You could submit um, for or against um, whether um, we our community vehicle trust would be um, could receive that. Funding, and I know when the mayor and I went to make our submission at Environment Canterbury, there are quite, we got a couple of questions on the Community Vehicle Trust. There's I can't remember how many. Um, there's a lot of other vehicle Community Vehicle Trusts in Canterbury, and they are all um, rated the same, similar way. Um, and when we looked at our um, how our Vehicle Trust was going to operate, because we couldn't work or operate within the Ashburton town boundary, we went to everyone else. And I think it was actually less than $2 per ratepayer. I think it was only about $0.50 cents a dollar per ratepayer for the service. Um, and yeah. And then the other comment I just wanted to make was, um, as you can see, we've been very, very busy. Um, we have safe community um, steering group meetings every two months, um, which I um, chair. Um, Leslie does an incredible amount of work for the for the 20 hours that she's employed each week. So um, she's she's going above and beyond with all the different projects. And I think there's um, a real sense, especially in our steering group meetings, that we're getting um, a lot of work done. And yeah, really good work. Thanks, Leslie. Thank you. Thank you, Les. Diane. Thank you. And I'd just reinforce Liz's words thanking Leslie for the work she does and having sat around the table at those by every second month at the meetings, the table's ever expanding, isn't it? We're always looking for new seats to make the tables bigger and to then see the work and the results now coming through in the community, having sat there from the beginning, is, is really quite special. So thank you for that, Leslie. Just a couple of comments. Um, talking about the ECAN money to Councillor Mackay, there is some ECAN funding that comes within the borough, but that goes to total mobility and is utilised there where the taxis get work to do work with people who are immobilised themselves. So thank you for the report. I did have one more thought with the tool theft one. I thought a good idea might be to get into the likes of ACL, for instance. They have a big workshop with about six to 12 mechanics. Perhaps some we might be able to reach into those big workshop places and um, talk personally because I know their toolbox does a worth about six or eight thousand each. It was just a thought, passing thought. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Lynette. <coughs> Lin Lin just going to ask, going back to the community transport, because um, it's still beginnings of it. What are the numbers like? You know, because at the start there was very little. Using it, are we gaining? You know, how many are we kind of averaging out there? We're probably averaging about five or six people a month, which doesn't sound a lot, but the 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 person from ECAN said actually that's really good. A lot of very well established uh, vehicle trusts only have that sort of number. Mm -hmm. But one of our problems is that, well not problem, but it's preventative because we, we're only operating at the moment on a Tuesday and a Wednesday. And a lot of people are ringing up saying, look, I need to come to the dentist on Friday. I live in Medvin, I need to come down. And we're saying, sorry, we can't take you. So we are moving to, in October, we're going to move to an on-demand service, which will be available Monday to Friday. Not on the weekends, because we have to think about our drivers. Um, but so that way, if someone wants to come every Thursday to the EA Network Centre and they live in Hines, we can go and get them and make a regular booking with them and drop them off and pick them up and take them home. Um, it'll give a lot more flexibility and the feedback we've had from some of the health agencies and social service agencies is that's going to work a lot better for yeah. people. That's good, thanks. Thank you, Lynette. Angus. Supplementary, if I may, along the transport theme. Um, 
does total mobility still operate outside the Ashburton uh, town limits? As far as I know, yeah. Yep. The answer is yes. Yep. So, um, is the coordination between the community transport service and total mobility if someone like you said wants to come in on a day that the community service is not running? I think a lot of that's around um, the level of disability of the person. I mean, at the moment, we're using a community van which doesn't have disabled, doesn't have a, a lift okay. on it, you know, whereas the taxi company has a mobility taxi so they can take people in wheelchairs, and that's what that scheme's for. You know, we're not do going down that track. Uh, when we purchase a vehicle, it will be a car, so we still won't be in a position to, to offer people with a you know, significant disability uh, a ride in our transport, and that's what total mobility is for. Again, this, and this. I'll just make a comment on that. Um, our community vehicle um, trust that we've set up, one of our um, trustees is also the chair of total mobility. Is Maxine the chair? Yes. Yes. So there is a connection there as well. One more question for me, I think. Um, falls and elderly, are we on par with other districts? Are we worse or is it just all over? We're above the national average, but virtually everybody's above the national average. It's uh, all the safe communities, there's about 20, 24 safe communities. All of them have a focus on falls and the elderly. Um, it's be just predominantly because, you know, we have a, an older population and... Um, <coughs> Yep, so we're above the national yeah. average, but that doesn't mean much. Um, okay. Thank you, Leslie, for this last 25 minutes. Thank you're you. getting close to half an hour, so you're not doing too bad. <laughs> um, Kevin, you've got a really easy seat there, isn't it? You call it a hot seat, but no answer, no questions. <laughs> I've got one thing for you, if you really want to. I've got a real good second-hand e-bike. <laughs> <laughs> It's a wee bit too small for me, so I upgrade it. Thank you both for being here. Councillors, we've got a break, I think, now for 20 minutes. 50, yeah, about 20 minutes for a cup of tea, and then we're coming back. Thank you. Thank you uh, we accept donations of e-bikes. <laughs> so <laughs> just cover it off. I will talk to the boss lady. Okay. <laughs> I know my place.
Great. It stops flashing, it's on. Good afternoon, after the cup of tea, the last run till the end. And Sarah, you're the one who's going to uh, start it off for us. Welcome, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, um, and thank you for having me come and talk to the, for the second time. So I'm still in the honeymoon period of you being nice to me. Um, <laughs> so um, this is the six monthly report. Um, so we opened on the 2nd of December, so this is over the period of seven months data. So um, yeah, I'll get into it. So a big thanks first and foremost to the councillors, the Ashburton District Council, and also to the community of Ashburton for supporting the Citizens Advice Bureau so far, and also for incorporating it into the um, long-term plan. Um, pretty blown away, obviously, from the start with Leslie's support and backing and, and you all. So I just want to say a huge thank you. Um, it means a lot for the community, um, and it also means a lot for your support for other funders to support us as well, to know that you guys are supporting us. So thanks very much for that. Um, so we opened on the 2nd of December. We had um, 15 volunteers in place and one room in community house. Um, we've grown now, we've got three rooms. Um, we're running on a model, it started in England, and we're running on a model that they're using at the moment, and where they have an interview space, and then they have kind of a back work room where they do all the researching and have the computers and things like that. So. I've tried to do a little bit of both, so I've got laptops so that they can bring the laptops into the interview room to help empower them to be able to do some, some of the stuff themselves and look up stuff themselves, but kind of that kind of essence where it takes the pressure off. You can go back with the other volunteer, talk about some information, and um, yeah, so it's working re incredibly well at the moment. Um, so the new service is playing a vital role in helping residents, newcomers, migrants and tourists to Mid Canterbury um, navigate issues about rights and responsibilities and how to access the services that our community has and also to find those gaps um, that, are, that are not being met by the community. So CAB National Office is providing oversight um, to support the project at the moment and mainly that's around just the complexities of setting up the, the board where they have to be accredited volunteers before they can be on the board. So we're just working through that. So we're still in our establishment phase and we're already seeing lots of strong data which um, we're using very well. Um, and being able to, um, Leslie might be able to just quickly comment on how we're... Um, yes, so, oh, the table's going. Um, Sarah, um, as part of um, how gracious she is, comes along to both the Safe Community Steering Group by monthly meetings and also the Caring for Communities Group and gives us her data for um, the kind of inquiries that are coming in, what's top line, what's happening. It's absolutely fascinating getting that feel for what's going on in the community, like live because these are, these are people ringing up and coming in, and each time she presents that material, it's different. Um, she was able to give us a lot of information about inquiries around social and emergency housing, which has been really useful as well. So the value of the service in terms of identifying kind of what's going on for, for the community and potentially service gaps, like what's not there that people are looking for and, and we don't have that service, is really, really valuable. And the, the other, one other thing I'll say, and then I won't say any more because I'll start hyperventilating again, is um, the calibre of the volunteers that Sarah has is, is very impressive. She has virtually every professional retired person in the district as a volunteer for, <laughs> for them, and uh, they, are, they are stunning, and they're taking on some incredible work as volunteers. So, yeah, I really observe that each time I see them in the, in the community house. Thank you, Leslie. 
Oh, that's a big plug for the volunteers, and I'll just say it right now. We've got ex-police, ex-school um, teachers, ex-managers of social services, ex-nurses. Um, we have a broad range. At, we've got an accountant I just signed up today. Um, we, we've got phenomenal, phenomenal volunteers, so we can't do it without them. So, yeah, thank you, Leslie. Um, so a bit of the background I covered last, this is all stuff that was in the last report, so if you've got any questions please um, let me know. Um, so key achievements, obviously we're, we're open, so that's a huge achievement. Um, and we've um, opened Monday to Friday 10 to 1. Um, we've also got obviously the, the backing of the whole organisation, which is what really gives it its strength in that we've got access via the 0800 number and the online website and all of that sort of stuff is in the background. So if somebody ring, you know, from the community rings up um, and wants some support, they can actually get that support when we're not open as well. So that, that's a huge thing. And there's an online chat function. And yeah, so just a fantastic um, ability there for us to provide services. They can also look at our directory, so say somebody rings up and it goes through to somebody in Timaru, they can answer it and look at our community directory and information and answer on behalf of kind of like our information. So that brings in that whole community directory and how important it is and having it all online and accessible for everybody. So um, the volunteers obviously also gain a lot of knowledge and experience that they then bring out in their work as a volunteer, but also in their home life. And a lot of the comments that the volunteers are giving me is that they just can't believe how much it's improved their own knowledge of anything from consumer rights to migrant issues to um, buying a car to, to anything, IRD stuff, and just knowing that they can help other people. They're just, yeah, in their own life as well. So that's really, really interesting. Um, I'm just skipping through to page six, so just the things that we're going to be working on. Um, so we're just going to, there's always going to be an ongoing work on volunteer um, recruitment, development, training. It is a huge undertaking to be a volunteer and to be accredited volunteer, so just developing them and um, keeping them happy. I have biscuits in the, in the room and fruit, and there's tea and coffee, and I put on a lunch once a month um, for training, so just trying to keep them happy and motivated and rewarded is um, quite important to me. It's, a, yeah, like I said, it's a huge role, so, um, and quite stressful, so I'm really proud of them. Um, I still haven't done any actual recruiting, like any, um, spending any money essentially, I haven't spent any money on recruiting or advertising. So a lot of the stuff that's coming in is just people that have heard about it or word of mouth and just know the value of it. So that's fantastic. Um, speaking on not promoting it either, I haven't done a lot of promoting in terms of the service. So I've done a lot of presentations to groups, but I haven't done a lot of um, publicity on purpose. And the main reason for that is that I really just don't want to overwhelm those volunteers to start with. Um, because some of the stuff that's coming in is quite um, tricky to deal with, um, you know, relationship issues, my boss isn't paying my wages, um, bullying, um, lots of legal stuff, um, they just don't know where to go, and so being quite stressed, you want a volunteer that can cope with that. So. I don't want to overwhelm them with so much stuff that comes in, so we're just kind of not promoting it too much to start with. So that may reflect in the numbers, but it means that we're going to have a really good solid base of volunteers that can then train and support the new people coming, new volunteers coming in. So I think it's a it's a good way to do it. Um, we're getting a lot of um, kind of developing it into our teams. We've got somebody putting their hand up to be the social coordinator. We've got some peer reviewers, and obviously with the directory team, things like that. And we've got some. Um, I've got a team which I kind of call the um, kind of they're almost the new steering group 
um, but a local advisory group, but they'll eventually be the board. Um, so I've got uh, five members of our current volunteers that are keen to put their hand up when we're at that point, so that's really good. Um, obviously, we're going to just continue and review our opening hours. Um, obviously, I'm reporting on till June, but I've actually already extended our hours over the last few months. We're also um, open Tuesday afternoons and Friday afternoons as well, so kind of developing that as, as and when we get more volunteers and demand for the service. Um, clinics, we're obviously running two, two clinics at the moment, the tech clinic and the immigration clinic, I'll talk about that a bit later. But there is possibility of running other things like, um, we can see that employment is obviously a big issue around employment, people wanting help reading contracts, Bullying is a really big one I'd like to look into. And also, um, yeah, we can just run some clinics around those issues or around um, healthy homes or all that sort of stuff as we see some issues kind of cropping up. So I'm quite excited about the potential and the capacity for our service to be able to do that um, when we see gaps or work with others that, you know, when we see stuff. Um, the community directory um, of resources, obviously we're... Um, We've got a heap of resources for people, so obviously we do a lot of online stuff, but a lot of people are not so savvy online, um, and we don't want to discriminate against them. Um, so we've got a lot of resources, um, so for example, um, immigration stuff, working and living on a dairy farm, working in hospitality, there's stuff on employment rights, there's stuff on healthy homes, consumer products, um, buying a car, um, all sorts of different things that um, can help people so we can use resources as well as online links and email links and um, and just talking to people in 0800 numbers so there's a lot of kind of stuff that we can give to people depending on the topic so that becomes obviously quite an issue because we need to be quite broad <laughs> they can come in with any absolutely any question so um, yeah we're just kind of still developing what the questions are coming in so what the resources we need to to provide for people, so a little bit of a balancing act there. Community House is being really good and supportive in terms of um, giving us space to um, store those resources and um, having them accessible when we're not open, so it's accessible in Community House, so open to anybody. Um, I'm on to page seven. Um, obviously we've been in talks with Bruce Moffat from Experience McCanterbury, and we've got a um, tourism display stand up um, next to my office and he comes in once a week roughly if he's if he's around and um, provides an update on what's going on and anything we need to kind of be working on or looking at and vice versa we let him know what anything that's coming in um, so when I started we were quite keen to run a satellite service and I was advised just to get my base sorted first Hence why we haven't kind of gone anywhere else. Um, you can see from the figures later on that um, there hasn't been that much demand from elsewhere. Although I will say that well, I think a lot of people say they're from Ashburton and they don't want to identify that they're from one of the little towns in case that's too identifying. So I'd have to say that if they if they actually say they're from Ashburton, they might actually be from Hines, for example, because they don't want to. Um, yeah, and our, if it's a tricky situation, they don't want to be that, that identified. So, yeah, take that with a bit of a grain of salt. Um, so, yeah, so a lot of the stuff we're still doing is seeking funding towards operational costs and, yeah, developing that structure and that incorporated society. And the ongoing and, well, ever, never-ending development of the community directory um, is just one of those things that's just going to keep growing as we find new groups and new... Um, projects up, up and running that we'll um, make sure we did quite a bit um, obviously talking after June we've done stuff with COVID just updating say for example the um, food banks who was open how to access that service all that sort of stuff so trying to make it we're pretty um, able to edit it um, quite easily so once it's up on there um, so yeah some of the figures pretty exciting um, client inquiries, so the last report I gave you 
uh, December to February, we had 69 client interviews. So um, for the 2nd of December to 30th of June, for the seven months, we had 221, which is fantastic. That's just phenomenal. Um, I had a call from National Office yesterday when I sent through um, the report last week, and they were just blown away by, by our numbers and figures and our data. Like, they're so impressed with what we're doing. So um, I was a little bit proud. <laughs> um, OK, a lot, a lot proud. <laughs> um, so face-to-face, -face, we're obviously getting a lot coming in face-to-face. -face, so that's um, really good. Um, Phone, we're getting a few through, and electronic, so emails, and that also covers um, Messenger. I'm on Facebook, so we're taking a few um, messenger, um, messages through Messenger. Quick reference, so that's 118, so signposting is when you, so when somebody comes in, and if they say, I would like to know about budget service, the budget service, and if we give them the budget service phone number, that's a signposting. But if they came in and we want to know about budgeting, okay, this is budget service, you want to know a bit about um, CAP, Christians Against Poverty, there's Sorted, we can talk to them a bit about their budget, anything else, that becomes a bit more of an interview. So that's the difference between, between the two. Um, so signposting, we did 107 um, and gave them some brochures, um, eight. Um, clients attending clinics, we had 30 attend um, the technology clinic. The immigration clinic, it was their first session um, covered in this um, data, so um, we didn't have anybody turn up to that first one, but I wasn't expecting um, huge numbers to turn up the first day. Um, how they came in, that's a little picture. Um, so in terms of last data I gave you, um, it's we've increased in our phone data that could possibly have been over, um, I'm not too sure actually why, them knowing about us, I'm not too sure, and electronic was down, um, so yeah, a decrease in that. Um, top 10 categories, so we've got legal services, um, the last data um, we had um, income support second, now it's gone to consumer. Um, income supports dropped down one. Conditions of work has gone up um, three spots. Courts, that's gone up four. Um, relationships has come into the top ten categories as a new new one. Personal supports dropped down. Budgeting and general difficulties has dropped down. And care and home support has dropped down. So it's kind of a change at the start. We were kind of about community and budgeting and, and home care and personal support. And we've kind of done a real shift towards um, employment, um, conditions around work, that kind of stuff, and legal services around that. So the second one is, the top one on page nine is a bit of a little another graph on how that looks. The next picture is actually um, a repeat of the first one, so don't worry about that one. Um, time taken. So this kind of just looks at how long it takes us to talk to somebody about some of these issues. So obviously the first one again is the conditions of work. So this is really starting to build a picture over the last seven months. That work, employment, um, bullying in the workplace, pay, holiday pay, there's a big gap in, you know, how to read a contract. I've got to start a new job. What do, how do I do this? Like, there's a real gap in this area. Um, also, obviously, uh, within that is COVID. So there's COVID's kind of impacted a, all a lot around that too. Um, arts, hobbies and social activities is an interesting one to be in there that we take so long answering one of those questions. But often those, um, those ones are around a new person to town and they kind of just want to chat, really. <laughs> they want to come in, they want to talk to somebody, they're new to town, they want to know what's available. So it's really a conversation around what we've got here. We've got lots here available <laughs> to a new person. So just going through all the things that they want to be involved with. So that's why that takes quite a while. So... I'm going to turn the page.
Sarah, if I can yes. ask, just pick up the highlights if you can, because we've got someone else quartered too, so we've got another 10 minutes okay, cool. for you to tell us what you want and yep. for us to make questions. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, so once again, um, when it drops down to carrier degree three inquiries, it's more around the Consumer Guarantees Act goods and services. So that's really interesting that a lot of the stuff picks up in the first category as kind of employment stuff, but then it starts picking up with um, complaints about goods and services and that top one there. The reason why there's kind of like, if you added all their numbers and inquiries up, is that a lot of the times people come in with multiple stuff. So they might come in with an employment issue, but it might actually capture a number of different categories. So that's why there's, yeah. So if you're, yeah. I hope that explains it. Um, so client profile, page 11. Obviously, um, Ashburton, we've had the majority. So 166 clients from Ashburton. Brookhire has been the biggest increase in the other little ones, um, with nine picking up from last time. I'm not sure if it's true, but we d have done a lot of work with updating the community directory. So we've started in Brookhire. Um, so we've made contact with kind of the news there and we've um, made contact with um, all the community groups so maybe it's just them knowing about us that could have increased that, I don't know, possibly. Um, we have a lot more females coming to us than men. 63% <laughs> females. In terms of our age groups, um, nationally, the average, the highest kind of category is the 30 to 39 year olds. And while we, I would have seen them as being pretty tech savvy and able to look at stuff themselves, it's actually the fact that at 30 to 39 they are buy, you know, buying a house, they've got family, they've got work issues, they've got, you know, there's multiple things going on there. So, but in our district it's older. <laughs> um, our biggest numbers are, are older, so over 40s is our biggest. But ageing population here, it's you know, quite reflective in our community. The same goes um, with our ethnicity. We're quite reflective with our community here. Nationally, also, it's New Zealand European. Um, we buck the trend a wee bit. Nationally, Asian is the second highest, but ours is Māori. So quite interesting to have that, um, that there. Mm. Pacific people, we've got an increase of 7% um, from last time, so that's really, um, really good. We're doing a bit of work there. Um, so we've just got a few pictures of our volunteers, which we talked about before, so that's really cool. Digital exclusion, um, I kind of use that as a bit of a thing to look at because that's what they did nationally last year. There's a range of things going on. Um, after lockdown, there was people wanting to access kind of JPs online. There was people so frustrated with trying to access something online during lockdown that they just wanted somebody to talk to and somebody to um, a person to, to deal with something. So it's really interesting. Um, so many people have smartphones, but actually they really they can't sign a document. They can't work out how to email you know something. They just so yes, they have a smartphone, but actually not being able to use it. A to its fullest potential, but also, you know, having something printed and signed and things like that. So, um, the tech clinic, um, yeah, just a fantastic um, service. We have people coming in all the time wanting to come and get a bit of help from really tricky stuff and scams and online stuff to, you know, I want to buy a computer and how do I buy it. Um, we've developed one of the volunteers, she developed a bit of a um, pamphlet. Um, and it's using all of, from our community directory, just all of the other options. So say they came in, we didn't want to replace the service. So they came in and they just needed a bit more computer skills. We've just listed all the places in Nashburn where they can go and get some computer training or skills. Um, CNNet, um, our uh, Ashburton Learning Centre and the Public Library and Time Bank. So yeah, really cool, um, cool service. Um, Ruben there from Geeks on Wheels um, is a fantastic um, person and Jim Hardy, the picture on page 16, who is 90 years old, has come in three times now 
and um, had his um, phone set up and yeah, was really appreciative of the service. Um, and then, yeah. The expenses from our profit and loss statement for that, um, it actually covers eight months, so it's slightly different to our, you know, our running was um, taken over by um, Cab NZ in November, so that covers eight months, not the seven months. And then I've listed all the stuff I've been up to, <laughs> the presentations um, and groups I've gone to talk to and training and collaborations and things like that. So there's a heap in there. Um, yeah, any questions? Thank you, Sarah, for your presentation. Are there any questions, councillors? And when are you coming to see me? <laughs> <laughs> Come and have a visit and see what we're up to. And Thank you. Stuart. Thanks, Mr Chairman. <laughs> Afternoon. Is, it's unusual to me, the majority would be a New Zealand European based female, 40 to 49. Why? I thought it would be young ones who were having difficulty with employment or didn't know things. 40 to 49, they would have had life skills, wouldn't they? Or why, how come we've got so many in, in this district in that age group? Um, I'm, I'm not too sure. I can look into the data more specifically and, and, and find that out for you. Um, I'd say there's just a lot going on. <laughs> there's a lot going on and there is tricky, um, possibly marriage breakups. There's relationship issues, there's employment, there's all sorts of changes and, and new things going on. And I, yeah, I also find it quite interesting that it's older than, than what the national average is. So I'm not too sure whether that's the kind of people that have found out about us. I'm anticipating there has been, the only promotion has been a little bit in the paper about you know when we opened and things like that. So maybe kind of the 40 plus age group is still the ones that are predominantly getting the paper. So that could be could be part of it too, I'm not sure. Yeah. We don't ask we ask them how they found out about us. So we ask them, you know, was it word of mouth or from another agency or things like that, but we don't yeah, that's so we can't I can tell you that, but yeah, not not more than that. Thanks Lynette. You've got more questions? I was just gonna ask the clinics here proposing to have in the future, will they be sort of fee paying ones that you'd be able to recoup some costs or are they gonna be free to the Yeah, public? they'll be free. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Lynette. Carolyn. Um, thank you, Sarah. Has your um review of the queries and things you've had, have they has that helped identify a gap in Ashburton? Anything that you think that the council could support with regards to one of the well-beings or is there any gap that's identified that you know community house could get involved in or anything like that yeah um yeah good question um i certainly supported um leslie in terms of the social and emergency housing um stuff so we, we could what i've been promoting at the moment is to all the social services and all the agencies that are involved with this is that if they have a project that they see um, they have an issue with to come to us and we can print off the data for it to support their project yeah. so I'm kind of looking at it both ways supporting other groups in the community already existing um, but also just seeing those gaps I think the big one for me I think is probably that whole bullying in the workplace um, and um, just not being treated right by so you've had a lot of queries. I'm in counselling, counselling, mental health yeah. kind of counselling. This, yeah. Oh, that's disappointing. But it's yeah, they sort of cross. Um, Councillor, if you speak in the mic, there, we can all hear. Well, there's, there's cross linkages between you and the and the rest of the group. I yeah, think that's important. Um, I suppose what I'm trying to do is work out what, like you said, what the gaps are. So trying to work out when the volunteers can't find out what the next step is for the person. So at the moment it's like you can do this and then you can go to this service and you can, that this is their phone number. But if it's like, well, we're not too sure what's next, that's the gap that I'm trying to find. And at the moment I think that one of the big ones for that is that uh, low cost, because of course you can pay for most things, but that low cost employment support, whereas I've got a new contract or I'm being bullied or, yeah, so that sort of stuff, I think, is possibly, yeah. Thanks, Sarah. 
to Ingus. start with anyway. Is a lot. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Sarah, tourism. Um, I notice on all the graphs um, in the top 10 categories, whether it's time or saying hello, tourist activity does not show at all. Then on page 10 I go to category 3 levels and I show emergency accommodation is 7, that's right at the bottom of the page. Tourists, again, nothing. Mm. Um, if we want something for tourists in Ashburton, do we have to rethink? Uh, is it because you're a block back? Is it because you haven't got a wee eye up? Mm. Or are you, do you know the reason? Or are people just not interested? Yeah, um, good question, Angus. Um, Bruce did say that the Somerset Grocer was capturing a lot of that um, market with that eyesight stuff. Um, potentially, they could get captured at the um, at reception right. um, at community house and just guided to the stand. Right. Um, and so it wouldn't be unless it's the next level stuff that we would help with. So what we have helped with so far is um, like bus timetables and trying to um, find support, like who can take them to Christchurch or, or, or Timaru or things like that. Um, yeah, so um, uh, quite a bit around um, employment, um, not being paid. Um, yeah, so in terms of tourists, that, that sort of stuff that we're, capturing at the moment. Um, yeah. Thank you. Two more. Diane is the first one and Lisa's after. Thank you. Um, Sarah, as you were talking about perhaps running groups, um, and I wrote a note, as needed or uh, hopefully in, in some of those groups needs, there could be other agencies that you can yeah. hand those people to. Would you do that? Rather Absolutely. Than try and run Absolutely. A group yeah. Yeah, if somebody else is doing something, we would just refer it to them. It's more around if we can see a gap that is not being filled, mm. absolutely. Or work with somebody, another agency. I'm all about working with other people or referring them on to something that's existing. Yeah. Thank you, and I just think well done on how well you've grown this and without going out and publicly advertising it. Thank you. Thank you. I've just got one last one question, um, and that's about the community directory. And I know it's it's really important. How far away are you from kind of getting that up and going so that there's enough services, etc., on there? Um, I we've already surpassed what was already existing on Community House's um, site. So in terms of that, we're over and above what what yep. what you'd expect. Um, the directory is a little bit tricky to navigate. It has um, the propensity to hit um, nationwide and Canterbury-wide um, information. So sometimes you have to go through it a wee bit. And it also, if you put too much detail in, so if you said Ashburton Bowling Club in the search, it would bring up everything that said Ashburton, uh, okay. bowling, and club. So it's a little bit about learning how to navigate it as well as what it actually is. They're making some changes in terms of trying to limit that nationwide and Canterbury so you can exclude them. So that's fantastic. Um, they're also in the process of um, developing those directories so we can pull stuff out. So we've got a new button that's just appeared on our in our um, in our background, um, and so they're just developing, you know, the next step of that. So that's really exciting. We will always be looking for new stuff to put on that directory. So we hope it's a living document. So we will just be keeping updated. Um, yeah, yeah. So Thank if you know of anything that's not on there, please just spread the word. And the more that we can get onto it, the the better the better it'll be. Thank you, Sarah and Leslie, for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, it was great, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. <laughs> and come and visit me soon, please. I almost kept you in 30 minutes. <laughs> oh, any time. Any time for you guys. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. The next one is Jen Cochran. She put in an apology because her father passed away, so there is no sport Canterbury. The next one we're going to get is the Ashburton Art Gallery.
Here all we said it. Good afternoon, we've got here in Castri Viani, Fleur and Selwyn here as the three speakers, as I understand. Good to see you, Fleur. Oh, lovely to see you. Thank you very much um, for having us. Kia ora, everyone. Um, look, I just want to acknowledge before I pass over to Shireen, our um, curator slash manager, that we've recently held our 37th annual general meeting and we've been operating a gallery for over 25 years. This is our last um, agency report in this kind of forum to the council, but the committee would really like to recognise the partnership that the gallery and the council has had over a number of years. Your financial support and other ways you've supported us has been really appreciated by the committee. And we feel very fortunate to have become able to reach this next milestone um, as a gallery and to have um, worked on the gallery and, and now it's going in-house to council. And so we just really wanted to recognise that in this forum and say a huge thank you to the current councillors and also the councillors before you for their continued support. So, thank you. And thank you as well as coming, coming on board. Huh? And thank you as well coming on board. Pleasure. That's great. I'll hand over to Shireen. Shireen. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman and councillors for this opportunity to present the gallery's annual report. This is uh, a special moment for me um, as this will be my last report presentation to you on behalf of the Ashburton Art Gallery, Inc. I really wish to take a moment um, and publicly acknowledge the incredible support of the committee throughout my 10 years um, as manager and curator of what I think is the finest little gallery in New Zealand. The Gallery Committee are a truly dedicated and innovative group of people who care deeply about this community and our access to quality visual art experiences. Our community is incredibly lucky to have such people giving so much of their time and energy to ensure that the Gallery is a thriving and welcoming place for everyone. It has been my absolute pleasure to work for them and alongside them for the last 10 years. Okay, so for our annual report this year, I will share with you some of the highlights and speak to the performance report also. And since we deal in the world of visual art, um, we also have a slideshow which captures our year in review and images. This reporting period has been one of a lot of change for us. We continue to face the impacts of COVID-19 on our visitation numbers and activities. But we have also had a change to our staff and our team with the resignation of two staff members in June 2020 and January 2021. Our committee has likewise has, a, has had a tremendous year of meetings, workshops and um, adapting to change as developments with the merger with ADC continued. What did bring us a lot of joy this year was the celebration of the gallery's 25th anniversary in September 2020. We celebrated this milestone with a big fundraising event called the Art Grab, where artists from the gallery's 25-year exhibition history were invited to create small artworks to be sold for $125 each. The night was filled with artwork, um, the night was filled with entertainment, hospitality, and above all, incredible art, which for some, uh, it was actually fought over. <laughs> um, 
Art Grab marks the start of a series of fundraising events towards the commission of a new artwork um, for the public to mark this uh, incredible milestone in our history. So watch the space. I'm pleased to report that the gallery has achieved all its council set KPIs for the year. Following the first round of COVID-19 lockdowns, the gallery, like all neighbouring um, galleries in the South Island, has experienced a drop in visitation. In the past year, we have had um, 16,804 visitors through our exhibition and programmes. Pre-COVID, our foot traffic was steadily increasing and reached 21,617 in 2019. So overall, we are experiencing a 22% drop against pre-COVID figures. This is an alarming drop for us um, and one that we're actively trying to overcome. However, at the gallery, we find that level two is still a really hard level for us to operate in. We cannot safely host school groups or openings on site and group uh, visits by rest homes and social clubs drop also. You can see this um, reflected in our monthly visitor chart um, from August and September when we went into a quick level two lockdown. The drop of 875 visitors for the year can also be attributed to, um, small, to the Smaller Art Society exhibition in October last year. Due to the prolonged lockdown, a decision was made to reschedule the ASA show for later in 2020 and at a smaller scale. As you'll be able to see, we had increased foot traffic, but not to the same volume as we usually have in July every year. This year, we had a higher changeover in exhibitions with a whopping 24 shows as compared to our usual 18 to 19. This was due to a few smaller community-based shows, such as our collaboration with Mount Hutt College, Ashburton College, and Ta Taki Waitanga Ashburton for Kids with Autism group. Amongst these 24 shows, 10 were from our local community and 14 by artists across Aotearoa. In the mix were five, group, uh, sorry, five touring shows, six group shows, and two foyer installations. There are many highlights for the year to share with you all, but I will speak to two that were my personal favourites. One was our electrifying Chromosil by Christchurch artist Jana Van Hasselt. Jenna and her partner Harley transformed our gallery into a saturated spectrum of colour. Jenna's rainbow coloured ceramics were perched on a two metre high shelf and surrounded by a buzzing hand painted pattern. Although the exhibition created many logistic and safety issues for our team, it was by far the most striking exhibition of the year. The show was also praised in two critical reviews in Eye Contact and in Art New Zealand. Returning our pink gallery back to white was quite a mission um, for our team of staff and volunteers, but it actually turned out to be a really great team bonding activity. I also have really fond memories of Hamish Coleman's exhibition on returning. Hamish is an Ashburton-born artist currently living in Wellington. This show was a significant moment for his career as it was his first public art gallery debut. The show was warmly received by our local community who were mesmerized by the iridescent paintings which changed color depending on your viewing angle. It was also fantastic to have a contemporary artist depict local sites in our community in such a unique way. I was really overjoyed when the gallery committee approved the purchase of Hamish's title piece from the exhibition for the gallery collection. The painting called On Returning depicts Wakanui Beach both near and far and has just returned to Ashburton from being shown in Wellington. Um, you'll find a picture of the, um, of the artwork in, inside the report. Sitting alongside our exhibitions are a suite of public programs and learning sessions, which are far too extensive to go through one by one. So I've listed all of these for you in the report. As you can imagine, the changes to alert levels have a rather significant impact on our ability to run events and host groups. I want to acknowledge the incredible way in which our team has remained agile and changed plans last minute to still deliver what we can to our community. Our Molly's Masterpiece subscription have actually rose by, 50, um, rose by 58 new subscribers this year, and the delivery of our regular programs have remained stable. A favorite activity for the team was our Fafetu star making uh, installation, which was inspired by artist Lucky Loko Kia Kia, whose show um, was toured by Object Space from Auckland. 
Visitors were invited to view the show and make their own woven star, and these were displayed on our foyer wall for all to see over the summer period. We really loved seeing visitors return time and time again to see their own work on the walls. The activity also highlighted the incredible intricacy of Kia Kia's work and made visitors truly appreciate the ancient Tuvalu art form. Uh, I wish to briefly touch on the gallery's collection. This year, the collection grew by six new works. Alongside the purchase of Hamish Coleman's work, the gallery also purchased Isaba Tower Ashburton by glass artist Dominic Burrell. This is the first glass object to enter the gallery's collection, and it was inspired by our district. We also received a generous gift from the uh, estate of the late Yvonne Salter, an Ashburton artist and founding member of the Ashburton Embroiderers Guild. The gift included a framed uh, embroidery work of a kneecap and one set of embroidered slippers, which are a fine example of early works by Yvonne. The collection was utilized in two exhibitions this year, one with Mount Hutt College and the other with Ashburton College. Both projects resulted in public exhibitions at the gallery, which strengthened our relationship with teachers and high schools. With respect to time, I won't speak to the remaining part of the report concerning promotions and our work in the gallery sector. I will, however, um, speak to the gallery's performance report, which you're seeing the most recent draft of. Uh, if I can find my one. The accounts this year are being reviewed by Martin Wakefield Limited and will be submitted to Council in full by November as per our service level agreement. The gallery has ended the financial year with a slight deficit of 22,000. Our increase in revenue totaled 5,434 against the previous year and expenditure was an increase of 34,937 against the 2020 figures. The deficit is mainly attributed to increases in staff costs and inflationary increases to our expenditure. We have faced cost increases in areas such as postage, freight and packaging, which have been at an all-time high. We also had an overall increase of $6,763 in exhibition expenses due to the higher number of shows staged this year. Given the deficit, the gallery's careful management of its reserves have ensured that we are in a healthy position overall and we'll be able to recover this loss. I wish to end by thanking the District Council, both councillors and staff, for your continued support of the gallery and your commitment to ensuring that the visual arts have a home in Hakateri Ashburton. Fleur and I are both happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Sharon. Thank you. Are there any questions, comments, councillors? John. Thank you. Um, question relates to the statistics. One that I find a little bit concerning is the drop in the number of school group participants from 2,407 to 1,571, because I would have thought that's where your future supporters of things such as art galleries come from. Is there any reason for that? So through you, Mr. Chair, yes, there is a reason for that. So um, the, we had uh, two um, level two changes um, in this reporting period, and in both those level changes, we weren't able to host school groups. So that is the predominant reason for that drop. And we're experiencing it again now, actually. We've had um, lots of cancellations that were meant to come in over this period of time. Thank you, John. Carolyn? Uh, thank you, Sharon. That was um, great, and you can, can't really um, alter what you can't influence, so there's not much you can do about that. Um, I just have a question with regards to revenue from the store. It's just a question of where that would be. You know, you're, is that in um, providing goods and services? Is that there? Uh, through you, Mr Chair, yes, that's correct. And if you'd like to see a breakdown, I believe that is on page 10 um, of the performance report. Thank you. Um, there is the income and then the cost of sales. So that hasn't really dropped very much at all oh. when you look at that. 
Um, it hasn't in terms of uh, revenue, but um, we did um, do some purchasing for the shop that fell into this financial year, so our cost of sales are actually higher than yes. we would have liked. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Councillors, any more questions? Anything you want to bring in? I don't, you're being really nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's not unusual, of course, but I feel like everyone's ready to yeah. go home, huh? <laughs> I think it might have been a long no, day. But no, that's everything for me. We found some. Neil, you're the first one. Yeah, it has been a big day for us, and we get a bit um, puffed, but it doesn't um, diminish from anything. Um, I should just thank you and your gallery for the work you've done. You're now a council agency, uh, not an agency, you're a council employees, uh, which is great. And it's an end of an era for the um, art gallery, as it was, but it's still sitting there, the friends of the gallery, etc., will still be there. So um, you'll be reporting to us in a different manner. Um, but um, yeah, well done for all the 25 years that um, it's been going on for great. Well done. Diane? Thank you. And yes, I did have one last question on page uh, t 9 and 10. And it was, I think you partly answered it, Shireen, about the cost of sales being up $13,000. Um, and I guess also reflected on the next page was freight and postage and packaging, I see, were way up. So is that because you've been wrapping and packaging more goods for sale or what, what's the big increase there? Yeah, so through you, Mr Chair, um, we have had a steady increase in just the cost of freight. Um, I'm sure anyone in business will probably be facing the same thing. Um, so uh, our usual mode of transporting art is actually starting to cost us a little bit more. And um, the same thing has happened in terms of packaging, so bubble wrap and paper and all the things we typ typically buy for the art gallery. Um, and um, as you'll imagine, postage has also gone up for us. So these things are impacting us um, a bit more than more than before. But in terms of the level of activity, yes, the um, increased number of exhibitions means that we're obviously moving more art around, mm. um, and that's probably had a uh, an impact on that figure as well. Thank you. Well done on your report. Thank you, Diane. Um, yeah, my thanks as well to the Ashburton Art <coughs> Committee. Uh, I know it was not easy to come on board, but Council thought it was the best option for, for both parties. So hopefully it goes the right, the right direction, but um, I certainly am, am quite happy that you guys are part of it. Thank you. And thank you for your presentation. <laughs> Councillors, this is the end of the day. Thank you all for being here, staff being here, people watching it, and people who came here to present, present their presentation. Thank you all.